blind DMACC is a term actually coined by Dr. Garrett Mellis to refer to DMACC surgery being performed in an otherwise opaque cornea. And you might say, well, why would you want to do DMACC in an opaque cornea? And the reason is, is that very often the surgery is possible even with extremely poor visualization. And shockingly, in these very opaque corneas, just with an endothelial replacement alone, often it's the case that the cornea can become shockingly clearer just through an endothelial transplant. You often have very little to lose because even if the cornea doesn't clear up, you can always go back and do something more invasive like a PK later. And a DMEC is often a good first attempt at least to see what's possible. And I wanna show you an example of such a case that was operated on recently. This is an eye that has an opaque failed prior penetrated graft performed for reasons of herpetic keratitis. Now you may see that there's quite a lot of what looks like corneal opacification. Of course, there is very deep stromal scarring and vascularization. All of the sutures are removed. This is an old graft and this is a phagic eye. The vision at this point is limited, by the way, to hand motions. And we talked to the patient about doing a DMEC to try to bring some sort of clarity back to the cornea. And of course, if it doesn't work, we can always go back and replace the whole graft. But, you know, an endothelial transplant alone, if it would work, would have the enormous advantages of not having to reopen this giant wound. No sutures have to be in place for years. The healing period could be quite a bit quicker, so we thought it would be worth a try. You'll notice that I've just started this operation using topical anesthesia. There's topical tetracaine and intracameral lidocaine. That was a peripheral iridotomy made far inferiorly with a 25 gauge vitrectomy handpiece. This is a 25 gauge AC maintainer that I'm placing into one of the paracentesis that are created. And this AC maintainer is connected to an air pump. So the anterior chamber is now being filled with air to facilitate a decimeterexis. Now, decimeterexis, of course, can be performed under BSS, can be performed under viscoelastic, but preferably it should be done, in my opinion, under air. And the reason is that air maximizes contrast and visibility and highlights abnormalities in the posterior cornea. And of course, in this instance where the cornea is so hazy and opaque, you want the maximum ability to see what you're doing. You can see the air pump there gives me quite a bit of better control over the anterior chamber. Remember, this is a phagic eye, and even with the air pump, there's a tendency for chamber collapse and to lose a little bit of air, but with the air pump placed into a paracentesis, the stability is actually really quite good. So what you'll notice here is that we're gonna do a few things to sort of facilitate the operation, okay? So as I go along, one thing that you'll see me do here is I'm going to debride the epithelium. This is something I often try to avoid doing just as a matter of course, taking the epithelium off the cornea. But in my opinion, of paramount importance is to do whatever you have to do to see to maximize the chance of being able to perform the operation. So even though theoretically it's nice to keep the skin on the cornea and not to remove it, in this case I feel like if I can just take the epithelium off, maybe I'll be able to see a little bit better. This is not even primarily to facilitate graft unfolding. This is just to assist me in stripping the decimase membrane of the native Indo, uh, native penetrating graft from the recipient eye. This is a took blade I'm using just to debride the surface. And once that's done, now the next trick that I'm gonna use is I'm going to squirt tripan blue into the eye. And again, I'm using this to paint the endothelial surface to try to enhance my visibility of the back of the cornea. You wanna be a little careful with this tripan blue. You can definitely overdo it. If you overstain, you can uh, cause uh, sort of all of the structures to become this sort of dim, brownish, blackish blue, and it makes it difficult to see really what's going on in the eye. 
but I think judicious use of a small amount of tripan blue can highlight little tags in the posterior cornea that you would otherwise miss. So in cases of sort of uh, light colored irises, especially blonde or green, where the visibility is typically better than with brown irises, you can often get away with using a little bit of tripan blue to facilitate a decimeterexis. The other thing that you'll notice here is that in my left hand, I'm using coaxial max gripping forceps. And these are extremely useful to sort of palpate around the edge of the PK interface. And I can sort of feel the tissue. And it's possible to sort of develop an appreciation for what the decimase membrane feels like versus what the stroma feels like. And you can sort of tap your way along that interface and feel around for shreds of decimase membrane that you couldn't otherwise just visually detect. And once you find them, you can grab them and peel them out of the eye. So you'll notice I'm switching back and forth in between the inverted Sinsky hook and these coaxial gripping forceps and I'm using it to try to denude the endothelium and decimase membrane off the back of this PK. And it is tedious, slow, painstaking work, but you actually can make a good go of it as long as you're persistent. So this continues on for some time, checking the timer where about 15 minutes into the surgery now, maybe a little bit less, and you just go along and you're careful and patient and you try to remove the decimase membrane, and this is what it looks like after that's completed. So here we are, I'm just reinflating the anterior chamber, and you can see even with no epithelium and now no endothelium or decimase membrane, the cornea is still quite hazy, and you can see these deep vessels down at six o'clock in the stroma of the recipient PK. So now it's time to try to put the DMAC graft in and see what we can do with unfolding the tissue. Now I'm just squirting some additional lidocaine inside the eye because this is topical anesthesia. The patient is awake and we wanna to try to make the patient as comfortable as possible to maximize our chances of success here. So this is a 2.4 millimeter keratome wound created temporarily and now I'm injecting the graft into the eye and there it is in the anterior chamber. Now the first step, of course, is to remove this air bubble from the eye because the air bubble does not facilitate any maneuvers at the start. It just competes with us for our attention in terms of what's going on in the eye and manipulation of the graft. And now I'm just deepening the chamber. This is a phagic eye, remember. And I'm looking to see if I can determine any features of the graft at this point. This is facilitated by here, this is a light pipe used by the retina surgeons, and I'm not casting it directly onto the eye, but I'm sort of shining it obliquely from the side to create contrast, to cast shadows to see what I can tell. Now, I think I can determine that the graft is upside down, so I'm flipping it. I'm deepening the chamber, I'm irrigating with balanced salt solution, and I'm trying to have the graft open up so I can discern what's going on with its curls. There, as I see it, the graft looks right side up to me. And in this video, it's perhaps a little bit tough to tell, but with sort of the stereo coaxial view through the operating microscope, it's possible to appreciate this graft is indeed right side up, okay? I'm checking the Motsuro sign with the cannula tip turned blue, and therefore we have confirmation the graft is right side up. Now it's just time to unfold the remainder of the curled tissue. These are a few little shuffling taps that I'm applying to the surface of the cornea, and these are for centration purposes. And now that the graft is a little bit better centered, I'm tapping over the edges to see if I can't unfold the tissue. Now, interestingly, even though this phagic eye provides increased posterior pressure, which can make the surgery otherwise more difficult, makes it easy to open the graft. There's lots of pressure, so there's fantastic pinning. The graft is now open, and I'm just lifting it with this air bubble. And you'll notice the air bubble does not really want to propagate inferiorly. It's sort of stuck there at three-fourths of the way, but doesn't really want to go all the way down to the bottom of the eye. And also, if you'll look temporarily, you'll notice that there's an edge. There's sort of a fold in the graft. There's this horizontal straight line down where my cannula was. So the graft is still folded temporarily, and the air bubble doesn't seem like it really wants to fill the entire anterior chamber. So the way that we're going to address these problems is first we're going to shrink 
the size of the air bubble. And that's done by aspirating a little bit of the bubble and injecting BSS. Okay, so I'm injecting BSS and now aspirating, aspirating some of this air. And when you do that, when you shrink the size of this bubble, that enables you to place taps on the corneal surface. And those taps can be used to bubble bump, so to speak, this little inward fold at the edge of the graft. And this maneuver critically depends on having a small bubble in the eye. So now you can see the bubble is much smaller and these taps sort of over where that crease in the tissue lies are very effective at sort of ironing out that little uh, sort of imperfection in the opening of the graft. So now that little crease is gone, the inward fold is resolved, and we're putting air in and it seems like maybe the air bubble is better filling the anterior chamber, but still I'm a bit suspicious of what's going on inferiorly. So now I'm just using a cannula and I'm just sort of exploring down inferiorly to try to figure out what's going on down there. And I don't find any obstruction, so I'm just refilling the anterior chamber now. The chamber is pressurized. You can see the graft it is of a diameter smaller than the native recipient penetrating graft, so it doesn't overlap the interface, and the eye is pressurized. So now the chamber is 100% or 99% rather filled with air, and the graft seems to be fully attached. Now one thing that we've been doing now for several years is when the operation is done, we just sit the patient up. We don't make the patient lie flat in the recovery room or at home. So the operation is done. We recover the patient in an upright seated position and we sort of see how the cornea clears. And you might be very skeptical of this. You may be dubious and say, well, who cares if you can technically perform DMEC in this eye? The cornea is still lousy. It's still opaque. The vision is never going to be good in this patient. But you may be quite surprised. This operation, you know, of course, I fast forwarded a bit through the decime stripping, but really the whole graft unfolding just takes two minutes or so. You know, it's, it's a quite quick thing to try and just see what sort of benefit you get. And you may be shocked at the results. You may not need to do a PK. And the punchline here is I want to show you the same eye. This operation was performed in January of this year. And just five months later, just here in June, I want to show you the same eye now undergoing its second operation, this time for a cataract. This is the same patient. And if you look at this cornea, it is just shockingly clear with the DMET graft on the back. And you see this eye and you think, thank God we did not do a repeat PK on this person. This person is not a good PK candidate. That's the reason why their graft failed and it took them years to come back to the doctor to have something done about it. This is not somebody who's going to do well with a new PK with more stitches placed in a long recovery period. And then after that, you have to deal with the cataract. So the fact that you can rehabilitate this eye so much quicker by just clearing the endothelium with a DMEC makes this person able to undergo an operation so much safer and so much quicker. So here we are, we're gonna skip through forward all removing this dense cataract. And here we are with a new lens in the eye. And this is the conclusion of the operation. And you can just see how clear the visual axis looks, how good the cornea looks. Now that the eye is pseudophagic, this is an eye that sees well with a minimum of recovery and no stitches. So this case really was significant in my own sort of intellectual development and learning actually exactly what's possible. DMEC is such a beautiful, wonderful little surgery. There are just a handful of tricks that are repeated for graft unfolding. The healing time surpasses so much anything that's out there. It's just such a fun and rewarding operation for the doctor and the patient alike. And so what I would recommend is the next time you're contemplating doing a full thickness graft for reasons including endothelial dysfunction, you may just try giving DMEC a chance. It's a great way to build your skills and you may be shocked at the kind of visual results that you can achieve.